Hi, everyone. So glad that you're here on this webinar. And this is a topic near and dear to my heart, food. So this webinar is really going to focus on how to use automated infrared inspections for quality control in food and beverage applications. Uh, so I have the pleasure of introducing Michael, AKA Mac McKibben. Michael is a 1986 graduate of the University of Minnesota with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and is a level two certified thermographer. Michael started his career in 1987 as a sales and applications engineer for Minneapolis based CAD CAM software firm specializing in sheet metal fabrication. In 1992, he joined Laser Design Incorporated, a Minnesota based manufacturer of 3D digitizing systems as applications engineering and service manager. He joined FLIR Systems Incorporated in 1999, first as district sales manager and later as a regional sales manager of automation and OGI products. And most recently as national sales manager of IR automation projects, products, I apologize. Michael most recently joined Emitted Energy in November 2020 as a regional sales manager managing sales opportunities in the North Central Plains regions. So without further ado, Matt, can you please share with us a brief exclamation about Emitted Energy? I sure can. Thanks, Nathan. Really appreciate it. Um, so Emitted Energy, we are an infrared thermal technologies company. Uh, we're a supplier of infrared emitter bolts. And you know what we're going to talk about today, infrared camera-based monitoring solutions. Uh, we're based in Sterling Heights, Michigan. Um, we also have three field or satellite offices, one in Minneapolis, where I'm at, uh, one in Cincinnati, and then one in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, we are a FLIR certified gold uh, partner and system integrator. And then we've got 26 manufacturing reps uh, across North America to help meet with our customers out in the field and actually see their applications firsthand. Nice. So, Mac, actually, thank you for that wonderful introduction about what emitted energy is and sort of where they're located. So, I would be remiss if I didn't ask, what are some of the most important conditions in ensuring proper food safety? You know, when, when it comes to food production, there's a lot of different elements that go into making good product and, and safe product, you know, good ingredients, good equipment, sanitation uh, uh, rules and regulations. But there is one underlying condition or parameter that really spans all production applications, um, and that is temperature monitoring. Being able to monitor and control temperature is critical, really, to all aspects of food production. So, Matt, why is it like in what areas is temperature uh, so important? Uh, could you explain that a little, a little more deeply? Well, yeah, there, there, there's a number of heating and cooking concerns um, that are going to come into play. You know, we want to make sure that the food is properly and thoroughly cooked. We want to ensure the food is heated adequately to kill you know, all the bacteria and any other pathogens that might be in there. We want to ensure that we have uniform temperature distribution, not just across an individual product, but also across the entire line so that, that uh, uh, cookies on one side of the line are, are the same uh, consistency as ones from the other side of the line. We want to also ensure that the food isn't overcooked or burnt. We want to have that uniformity across the line again and make sure that everything is, is uh, properly um, well, produced. When it comes to the freezing and chilling side of things, we also have some concerns there. 
we want to make sure that food is properly frozen before we start to store it or package it uh, or get it ready for distribution. There's also some manufacturing processes where we may need to have the product at the correct temperature so that we can do that next stage of production. Cheese is a good example. I'm from Wisconsin. I know cheese, believe me. Um, if cheese is too warm, um, it gets kind of mushy and it's hard to cut. If it's too cold, it's too, it, it just it crumbles and doesn't cut. There's kind of that Goldilocks temperature there uh, for cheese where you want to have it just at, at, at that correct temperature for processing. Matt, that's so interesting. Like, who moved my cheese? I love that you mentioned uh, all those cheese lovers. When do you move the cheese? When can you move the cheese? And uh, when do you exactly. cut, cut it after? You know what I'm saying? Exactly. And this allows us to, to, to make sure that everything is at the proper temperature. And there's also some safety issues there, too, especially when you get into some of the dairy products or, or some of those types of things. We want to make sure that it maintains, that it never gets too warm uh, during that production process. So there's a lot of different uh, uh, locations and reasons we want to monitor temperature. Now, some of the current methods that have been used uh, through the years to monitor the temperature is collecting randomized samples. And I, I say that a little hesitantly because depending on the individuals who's collecting those samples, they may be taken from different locations. Person with a long reach may tend to reach further across the conveyor than someone who is really petite. And even though uh, inspectors are, are supposed to randomly select products, Human nature is it has a tendency to repeat and kind of do the same thing over and over. And so we may tend to collect the, the samples from the same location time and time again. It's also a very manual process. We're manually inserting a temperature probe into the product to measure the temperature of it. We're reading that temperature, and then we're manually recording that on a sheet of paper. It's also a very small representation of the product. We're not taking very many samples, um, partially because it's a destructive process. Once we stick that probe into the patty, we can't put that back on the conveyor line. It goes into the scrap pile. It's destroyed. And bottom line, this whole process is very laborious and it's very prone to errors. Max, so I can see why temperature monitoring is so important. And it's obvious the current methods are quite laborious. I mean, I just can't imagine training being so standardized where everyone's getting the probe in the right spot, like you mentioned. So are there more automated methods that customers can utilize to monitor and control their temperatures? There definitely are. And, you know, that's what our TPMS system is for. So the TPMS by Emitted Energy is a thermal process monitoring system. And it's not exclusive to the food uh, industry. We actually use it for a number of different applications as well. Uh, but it is a system that employs clear infrared automation cameras. We're going to measure temperature in a non-contact method from a distance. It's collecting literally millions of temperature readings per second. And each individual frame or picture that the camera takes is thousands of, of temperature measurements, somewhere between 76,000 and 300,000 temperature measurements in every single image that is collected. And those images, we can actually save individual images. So we're, we're doing the analysis on the temperature measurements, but we can actually record the thermal image uh, or a little movie sequence that can be recalled later or more additional advanced post-processing and analysis. Now, when it comes to monitoring the temperatures, there's some basic applications where we may employ just a single region of interest. In this case, we're just monitoring the temperature along the line. And if the temperature goes above one threshold, we give the customer an alert. We tell them, hey, you're starting to get a little warm. If it gets too warm, we're actually going to sound the alarm, shut down the line, uh, create all kinds of notifications. And those notifications can either be 
via an audible or a visual alarm right on the, the production line. We can also send an email or a text message out to production staff and production management. And of course, anytime we encounter an error uh, or an alarm or an alert, we're going to record that data. We're going to log the time and the temperature um, that, that caused that alert. And as I previously mentioned, we can record a snapshot or a little video sequence that can also be used to help analyze and see what's going on. Now, some applications, we may want to move up to monitoring zones across the line. So instead of monitoring one big area, we may want to put individual zones across here and monitor what's happening in individual lanes. We can alarm and alert based off of the temperature measurements in each of those individual zones. And then we can also do trend analysis and track the temperatures and the, the, the alarms that are created in each of those individual zones. The reports that are generated, um, this is just a sample uh, of what we can do. There's CSV files that are outputs with, with min, max, and average temperatures, uh, standard deviations, and of course, everything is time stamped, so we know exactly when these things occurred. And of course, as I previously mentioned, we've got the, the video and radiometric JPEG files that, that can be read directly into FLIR reporting software to generate FLIR thermography reports. Now, there are some applications out there or customers that have applications where they want more advanced capabilities. Um, and machine vision tools give us those capabilities. So because this is a machine vision camera, we can actually use machine vision tools to recognize individual product locations based off of shape recognition. So we know the location of all these little tater tot sized objects. And we can monitor now the temperature on each of these individual product samples. And now we can also take that data and create alarms and alerts based off of those individual temperature measurements. And of course, we can do our trend analysis on each of those individual products. There's also some additional value to using machine vision tools because now we can also use that same infrared camera to identify some non-temperature related product issues. Things like alignment issues, oversized or undersized products, overlapping or touching product, bent, broken, or fragmented products as well. Now, some of the applications are the typical products that we kind of have traditionally used thermal monitoring on is things like pre-cooked bacon, bacon crumbles, pre-cooked meats like burgers and sausages and, and, and chicken patties, uh, par-cooked snack foods like pizza rolls and egg rolls. And on the chiller side, um, you know, I mentioned the cheese and the dairy applications. Those become pretty apparent. But also frozen appetizers, French fries, onion rings, anything that needs to be frozen and, and brought down to a temperature before we can go off and store it. And, and there's also many other unique applications. There's one that, that I remember that um, was way outside of the box that, that I normally encountered, and that was a frozen pizza melt application. And it was a frozen pizza manufacturer, and so that your cheese doesn't slide all to one side of the packaging when you throw it, you, know, you put it in your bag, especially if you put it on vertical edge, um, they actually would melt the cheese uh, before they would package it. Um, and they, they did that by passing it underneath an infrared emitter tube. Um, and they would actually melt that cheese. The problem that was occurring was at times, the pizza may be offset a little bit from the cardboard carrier that goes underneath the pizza. Or in other cases, they may not even have a pizza at all. They may just have a piece of cardboard. And yeah, something happened if a pizza broke or whatever and got rejected, and they had just a pizza uh, cardboard underneath there. And the infrared lamps would get so hot for such a, such a short burst, they could actually set that cardboard on fire and then have a fire uh, as it exited out of the oven. 
and that customer actually wanted to monitor for fire. So it's a little bit different than monitoring temperature for the production, um, but it's using the same technology. So, Mac, are there other areas in food production that can utilize your TPMS? This is all very intriguing. Definitely. So once the, the product has been cooked or frozen or whatever other processes we're doing, we still need to get this package to get it out to the customer. And there are some uh, thermal related issues in packaging. One of the first ones we, we're going to look at is box seal quality. So when we put a box together, it comes as a, a flat package. We fold it up, we put some glue, and we close the flap. That glue needs to be at a certain temperature in order for it to adhere to that other flap correctly. It has to be dispensed at the correct location. And if we have dispenser issues like a clogged nozzle, we could end up with gaps, splatters, incorrect glue volume. There's a number of problems that can start to arise. Uh, and and then all of this is temperature related or can be seen as, as uh, with thermal imaging. And one of the cool things about box flap monitoring is we're not actually going to do it looking at the glue. We actually look at it after the other flap is closed over the top of it because heat conducts through the surface. And if that flap makes good quality contact with a glue that is pliable and hot enough, it's going to adhere. And we'll see that heat conduct out to the outside surface and create a pattern that we can recognize as a good seal. So by monitoring that, the temperature within each of those patches, we can tell that the temperature of the glue is at the correct temperature. And we can alert if that temperature started, starts to approach an outer range condition and alarm again if the temperature is outside that range. We can also monitor the size of the glue patch, how many pixels uh, meet this certain temperature requirement, um, and, and it can help us ensure that we've got a good quality seal. And of course, then we can begin to alarm if the, the, the glue patch is too large or too small as well, and create databases of this information so we can trim you know, what's going on on this production line. Now, when we get into induction seal, applications where we're taking a uh, screw-on cap of some sort um, and there's a little foil cap, a foil seal that goes inside of there with some adhesive on it. We put that on the bottle or the container and we actually pass that under an induction heating system. So the induction uh, heater creates a current that produces heat within the seal itself because of the resistance. And if we've got a good uniform um, uh, seal, a good seal, it's going to have a nice uniform temperature band or a ring. Um, it's going to show up really clear and, and crisp. When we have a bad seal, it's going to result in a very non-uniform um, pattern. We're going to have missing areas. Um, we're going to have too much heat in an area, too little heat. And these are all going to be caused by things like missing foil, cut or beam damaged seals, misaligned seals. We could have a problem with the induction system where uh, it's got too much power for this product or not enough power um, and it's not heating things up enough. Or we could even just in the middle of a production cycle have an induction system failure. We could have a coil go out and have product passing under that, that we're not actually heating up and creating a good seal. Thermal cameras are going to be able to catch all of this and give us these alarms early, early on in the process. Snack pack foil seals, um, kind of a mouthful. Uh, very similar. We're looking for patterns that are uniform. Uh, in this case, it's, it's somewhat similar the way it looks to the induction heating, but instead we're, uh, we're putting a, a hot plate over these and we're melting them uh, with this hot plate. Um, but the pattern basically becomes the same. So as soon as the platen is pulled away and the product moves on to the next stage, we can actually look at it and we look for these nice uniform rings or a nice uniform pattern with repeatable temperature profiles. 
And you can see what these good profiles look like across the bottom here. If we've got a bad seal, we're going to end up with gaps. Again, non-uniformity. We're going to have a big blossom of heat on one side and lack of heat on the other. We're going to have temperature variation. And a, this can be caused by a number of different things. Some cases, it could be a problem with uh, the foil or the seal. Other cases, it may be actually food um, or other debris is actually getting into the sealing zone. And because of that increase of mass, that is going into there, it's going to absorb and conduct heat differently and it's going to cause changes in the thermal pattern that we're going to be able to pick up very quickly and easily with the infrared camera. And here you can see some of the examples of some different bad seals. Bag seal inspection, again, we're looking for patterns. Um, but instead of being in a circle, these are going to be more linear. They're going to be long um, strips of heat that we need to have uniform and be consistent. Problems that can occur, we could have a heating bar malfunction, misalignment of the plastic rolls, wrinkles, or once again, product that's overlapping into that ceiling area. Um, and again, that the thermal mass in there is going to change the way the heat is absorbed and conducted and, and really change the thermal patterns that the camera is going to see. So again, we're looking for that non-uniform heat, that non-uniform shape, and outer range temperatures. And it kind of continues on. Once we get into oil pump seals, um, the shapes become a little more complex quite often. Um, so we're not just looking for nice linear lines or circles. Uh, we're looking at complete pattern and shape. But again, we can be, do it by monitoring temperature in discrete locations. Or we uh, might uh, actually start to count pixels and make sure we've got X number of pixels within a, a region of interest that reach a certain temperature. Or we might actually go ahead and start to employ some of the machine vision tools where we're actually doing that full-blown shape recognition and, and making sure that we've got the correct patterns. In the end, the TPMS system can do this for a customer. So it is a complete solution. It's non-contact. It gives us a 100% sampling completely non-destructive, so we're not wasting any product at all. It'll create automated alerts. It gives us data collection, so now we can go back and analyze what's going on. How often does it do these problems occur, and when did they occur? It's expandable. If all of a sudden we decide that we need additional cameras to get a different view, we can plug a different camera into the system. We don't have to start from scratch. Bottom line, it's going to reduce product waste. It's going to give you a measurable ROI because we're reducing product, we're saving time, we're, we're uh, saving labor. But the most important thing is it's really going to help you as a, a provider provide a consistent quality product to your customer. Wow, Mac, thank you. That was so comprehensive. Uh, I'm still trying to pick myself off of the floor about non-destructive testing. So I just want to thank everyone for spending these special moments, you know, with, with Mac and I, and, and uh, I know that you enjoyed this presentation. I know the juices are flowing with your imagination on your applications. How can I do this and that? So because your mind is turning now, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to these individuals. I don't know why you wouldn't reach out. Their names are on the screen. Their contact information is right there. I'm imploring you to do so. If you would like uh, to uh, get more specific application and uh, set up a, a virtual uh, tour or an in-person demo, virtual demo, then uh, reach out to Mac or Chris or Roy, and they would be gladly to do so. Lastly, if you want to see more of me and learn more about how you can connect the dots with thermal imaging, please follow our videos by going to YouTube, by typing emitted energy, or follow us on our LinkedIn page, or visit us at www.emittedenergy.com. 
thank you again for your time and we look forward to hearing from you right now. Again, thank you, everyone. If anybody has any questions, um, fire them away. You can type in the chat, um, and uh, Ricky can relay that over to us. Uh, so far, we haven't had any questions. Uh, uh, feel free to fire away if you have one. If not, we're probably going to go ahead and end this session again. We thank you very much. Please, please give us a call uh, with any questions you might want to have. Uh, you know, have a private conversation and talk about your individual application. As uh, Nathan mentioned, we can also arrange time to uh, set up visits uh, or virtual meetings um, to, to talk a little bit more in depth. Uh, looks like we just did have one question, uh, an individual asking about lens material. Um, you know, it kind of depends on a, a particular um, application, uh, location of the camera, and those kind of things. Uh, the lenses on the cameras and, and the, the housings are typically made out of germanium, um, which uh, can be picked up by x ray machines. It does not get picked up by um, uh, magnetic detectors or metal detectors. Um, but there are some things we can do, like put it in the catch basin, have the camera off, at, you know, out from over the line. Um, uh, in some applications, just doing uh, routine inspections is adequate for a particular customer. In other cases, we may move to a uh, polymer window. Um, they don't have quite as, as ideal of a transmission characteristic, uh, but they're, they're still plenty good, and, and we can definitely just use those. Uh, in these applications. So it kind of depends on individual applications that we kind of need to look at them. So thanks for the question. Great question, though. 